This is Making Comics 101, Episode 6, Scripting. <laughs> Greetings, people of the internet. I'm Scott with CircWorks Art Labs. Welcome, mad creators, to the Underground Laboratory, where together we are going to create some awesome comics because this is Making Comics 101. This is Issue 6, where today it's all about that script. Now, if you're ready to start scripting, hopefully you already have your plot laid out. Now, we covered plot in a previous episode, so if you want to go back and watch that, you can. If, if, if you just want to skip right to the scripting, if you already kind of have a basic idea in your head, we can do that. So that's up to you, but uh, we did cover plotting in another episode, so now we've got our plot. Where do we start? What's the format? Now, the thing about comics is there really is no standard format for how a script is, is created or presented. Uh, unlike, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe in Hollywood, the powers that be in Hollywood, they want something to be a laid out a specific way so they can sort of understand it and all that. I, I don't know, but I know as far as comic book editors, well, the thing about comic book editors is most of them don't even look at unsolicited scripts, so you don't really have to worry about that as much. But if you do have an inroad with somebody, um, I don't think anyone's too particular about how you present a script. I have my way of doing it. There are other ways. There are many different ways, and, and it's just kind of whatever you're... You, you know, personally works for you, and if you're working, if you're a writer working with an artist, or vice versa, something that, that works for both of you as a team. Now, having said that, there are two common approaches, and again, with those two common approaches, there are also different variations in between. So, uh, but I'm going to talk about the two different approaches that I know of. Um, the first one is the Marvel method. Now, this is a method that was first conceived or first put into practice by Stan Lee and, and the Marvel comic artists back in the days that they had been doing. Previous to that, they had been working off a of full script, which we'll talk about later. Um, but they started working in this format, and it seemed like it really worked for them. And they did that for a long time. I don't know if Marvel is still using the Marvel method. Uh, maybe some writers and artists are. Again, you can do whatever you want. But it it was very popular. It was almost the only way that they did it way back in the days. And basically what that is is that you had your plot. Stan Lee had the plot, the idea, and he would just present that to the artist, whether that was Jack Kirby or Steve Ditko. And because they are very competent artists and storytellers in their own right, they would just take that and run with it. They do all the illustrations and everything. And the key there, and something that's very important to remember, is that these artists were competent storytellers. So if you're working with an, an illustrator, if you're a writer and you're working with an illustrator, you want to do the Marvel method, it's very, it's imperative that they can tell a story visually. Uh, otherwise, this thing isn't going to work out. But let's say you guys are both great storytellers, writer, artist, and uh, so you give them the plot. They, they, you know, as Jack Kirby, he goes, he, he does his bombastic panel layouts and everything. You know, he's got the Kirby crackle going on and all this stuff. And if you've seen Jack Kirby pages, you know what I'm talking about. And then after that, what, what would happen would Stan Lee would go in and he would write in the dialogue. And it, that, that method worked out really well for Marvel for a very long time. And even though myself as a both writer and artist, I usually don't work in that method, it seems like a very fun, very collaborative effort or way of creating comics. So at some point in my career, I really want to try doing something uh, with that, that kind of Marvel method because the stuff that they created was just incredible. And you know, Stan Lee would, you know, he would look at, basically at what Jack Kirby or Steve Ditko or whatever did. And you know, sometimes he may have something in mind as far as the dialogue and he may say, you know what, we're going to pe peel that back because this picture just tells it all. And he may not even have to come up with his punchy Stan Lee dialogue for that particular panel. And, and again, that's why until like recently, it was really, I think, unfair that, that Jack Kirby and the other illustrators and, and comic book artists weren't properly credit for their work because they were really some of the creating forces. I mean, some say that they actually did a majority of the writing, but um, but that's so that's kind of the Marvel method. The other method is sort of the full script method. Now, this is the way that I work. Although, like I said, I, I do I find that the Marvel method kind of endearing. I guess I'm a little more detail oriented, and I and because it's just me, it's not like I can just hand it off to somebody and see what else they you know see what they come up with and then sort of be inspired by that. I've got to do sort of the whole thing. And I assume there's there's ways if you are both the writer and the artist to kind of do that sort of the Marvel method as well, where you just have a plot and then you just start, you know, drawing it out. 
and then uh, and then you go back and add dialogue and everything. Uh, but for me, I'm more comfortable, and maybe it's because I'm not as sure of my storytelling abilities, that I want to plan everything out sort of in advance. So I work from a full script. Now, there are all kinds of different script formats and everything that you use. I have some available for free with the Comic Maker Starter Kit. It's a free download. If you go to CircWorks.com, you can download that, and, and there is a template for, for using that. And I'll get more into the uh, templates and structures and everything once we get into more the process, I guess. So this is uh, this is the one that I think this is the one that's included in the, in the Comic Maker Starter Kit. Uh, this is the format that I one of the formats that I work with. Sometimes I'll switch back and forth through this and another one that's a little more like a screenplay. But this one's interesting because it's got the panels, uh, the description, and the caption and the dialogue. So basically, this format allows me to indicate how many panels there are. You know the captions, the the sound effects, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's just a, a nice way of working. Um, now, the thing, some of the things you want to consider when you're telling your stories, you want to, you obviously you want to build suspense and everything, but you also want to be cognizant of the page turn. So every, when you're laying out this and you know what, what's going to happen on each page, you can make sure that if it's any odd number page, and it doesn't have to be every odd number page, but maybe there's a, you know, especially with the end of the comic or, you know, that, that first page, a lot of times you want that page turn reveal. You're at the end of that, that particular page, you're like, oh, what's going to happen next? And you flip it and, and then it, it kind of grabs you. So be thinking about that when you're laying out your pages uh, on those odd number pages. And then after you've got everything laid out, then you can kind of go to your thumbnails, which we'll cover in another episode. But you want to, if you are a writer, you want to be considerate of, of your, your artist. You don't want to go crazy with the amount of copy that you're, you're putting in each panel because you want to, you know, be considerate of your artist and leave room for that art. And vice versa, if you're an artist, uh, when you're when you're laying out your your pages, you want to leave room for those word balloons. And that being said, you're going to have to learn how to censor yourself and sort of limit some of that dialogue. And we're going to get into dialogue specifically on a whole other episode where we will we'll we'll dive a little more deeper into that particular topic. So now we are going to move on to process. We've got to learn to edit ourselves. Kind of what we were talking about as far as censoring, you know, the amount of dialogue and everything that we do. Yeah, and you, that goes for the story in general. You don't want to be too attached to any one particular idea or concept because if you do that, then if another idea comes around, you may just kind of like not even consider it. So you want to be open to all these different ideas because something may work better for your story than what you already have. And if you're so attached to one way of thinking, then you're not going to entertain that idea. And sometimes you may come up with an idea that is going to be a little more concise and better get your point across quicker because, you know, we're dealing with comics and the, the quicker we can kind of get to the point and either with doing that with art or with with dialogue or narration or whatever, the better. So I, I right now I'm in the middle of uh, just in the beginning process of writing uh, issue number five of Young and the Dead. And there's a, there's a, there's a scene with, with two characters and there's something that has to happen that sort of has to spark this conversation. So I was thinking, oh, maybe they're coming out of a, you know, a movie or something like that. And then they get in the car, but eventually they wind up in the car or maybe they meet somebody or, or whatever the case is. And, you know, so I was plotting all this unnecessary stuff out when I realized they could already just be in the car and whatever that information is could be coming over the radio. So we want to think like that. We want to think what's the simplest way to kind of get the point across without all this extraneous exposition and, and scenes and things that aren't really necessary. And speaking of scenes, one thing that's very important right off the bat when you're introducing a new scene is to create an establishing shot. And this is, you should, in most cases you want an establishing shot to show your reader where you are in the story. Where Where, where is this taking place and everything? Uh, in Say, for instance, in uh, here's an example from my book, Young and the Dead. This is issue number one. We kind of see the two characters kind of walking. We see that it's a suburban area. But once we've established that, then once we get into it, we don't have to have as much, you know, we don't have to have as much detail. Uh, just maybe little things in the background. We see they're, you know, they're walking through a neighborhood. Now they're in a house. But, you know, if we just start off with this scene, 
we don't have a we don't have really have the scope we don't really know exactly you know where we are in general so whether it's a, a city skyline or wherever the case is you want to sort of have that establishing shot to start off with now there are some times where you don't you don't want to, to let your reader know exactly where they are uh, in this case this is issue number two of young and the dead we this start this is the first page it starts off with the close-up of this character now the reasoning for this is they're actually in a treehouse but I didn't want you to know and you can see a little bit in the background you can see the wood and some some pennants and things like that but the thing is this is sort of a, a flashback but I don't want people to know it's a flashback spoiler alert if you haven't read Young and the Dead 2 <laughs> In the previous issue, they were up in the treehouse, and I want you to think this is a continuation from that scene, when in fact it's a flashback in that same treehouse, but but years ago. Now, if I pan out and show the whole treehouse, you're gonna, I mean, there's some, some little cues and clues in here to that maybe this is a little different time frame and everything, but you may not pay attention to that. If I end up showing the whole treehouse, then you, you would know right off the bat where you were. So there's sometimes where you want to do that, and then sometimes you can just get clever. You don't have to start right with the uh, with the establishing shot here is a great example from my friend Corey Kerr from this from hell's from from hell's heart uh, and it starts off with it's you don't you can't even really tell what it is or where you are but as we zoom out we see this is the eye of a fly and then it just it keeps zooming out further and further till we see this island that everything is on so so that's another a clever way of doing it but by the end of that page you have your establishing shot and you know where you're at all right, so you know the old saying, a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, when you're writing your story, that's something you really want to keep in mind because we don't want to tell what we can easily show in our artwork. For instance, we don't want to write this long narration, you know, it was a dark and stormy night and the rain pattered on the window and all this kind of stuff, if we can show that. And you definitely don't want to do both. <laughs> you don't want to be describing what you're already seeing in the scene. So, and, and this is going back to uh, one of my favorite examples of all time is the Super Friends because it's just, it's, it's a great show for me because it's fun but they would do this a lot of times where you'd see Superman flying into the air and then the narrator you know I think it was Ted Knight who would, who would narrate it and he'd be like Superman is flying through the sky on his way to Metropolis but you're seeing that so you don't need to tell that and and show that at the same time so you don't tell anything that you can easily show with pictures now as a general rule you want to limit your dialogue and your exposition and to be perfectly honest I struggle with this a lot if you look at some of my my pages <laughs> uh, you can see I have quite a bit of dialogue going on um, and then you know and then I as much as I tried not to do this there are times where I just need to get some exposition out so you're gonna see a lot of stuff like this going on and uh, maybe there was a more creative way I could have done I could have went about this but I remember I struggled with this for a while and finally I just said you know we're gonna we're gonna pan into the kids discover this video cassette and on this video cassette is somebody explaining some of this information so I tried to do something a little original rather than just having uh, an average person just in this course of conversation explain that now there are other things like my comic book is a zombie comic but the zombies in my story behave differently so for instance they have some regenerative properties and things like that but in in introducing some of these concepts so that my reader knows what's different about these I could have had them just come out and say it or, or whatever in some kind of boring way but a lot of times what I'll do is like in I think it was issue two where they're discovering certain things and they're trying to figure out what, what makes these zombies tick but they're actually fighting the zombies at the time and while they're kind of bashing into an action scene there's dialogue going back and forth saying you know introducing these concepts while we're beating up on these zombies or we're, we're, whether we're trying to save our lives and and escape from these zombies so all the while when this action scenes going on there's some banter back and forth between our characters and that helps get some of that stuff out there so so we know in sort of a more interesting way now as I've mentioned there are a number of different ways I could have gone about this maybe I maybe I came up with a clever way maybe I could have come up with a better way but you ought, that's the one thing you want to think about your script should should be able to be altered you don't want to be so attached to your script that you can't add it or 
change or come up with new ideas. Especially in your first draft. You really don't want to be too, too precious with that first draft. This should be a, a document that can change and you can add things to, at least in the beginning, before you get sort of to, closer to that final draft. So previously I talked about some of my storytelling templates and the way I lay out stories. Whether you want to do Marvel way, whether you want to do full script, there's a number of different ways you can do this. If, if you prefer, you can write all this out longhand on, in notebooks and everything. If you're typing things out, there's a number of different programs you use to accomplish this. You can use a word processing program like Word. There are apps specifically for writing scripts, like I think Scrivener and Final Draft. You can use my templates. Back to the beginning, there's no set format, but there are some, some things that may work better for you than other, and maybe you can try certain things like that out. Now, if you are working with a digital letter, somebody who's not lettering by hand, or if you're doing that yourself or whatever, which um, I've done both, uh, in my anthology stories, I've done hand lettering. In my comic, Young and the Dead, it's it's digital lettering. But if it's and for my own purposes, when I'm when I'm writing something like that out, I, I usually I think I'm using Word or like Open Open Office or something like that to to script everything out, to drop my formats in and everything. But one of the things you want to be able to do is to be able to easily copy and paste that into you know whatever program you're using to generate your your digital lettering. Now I I don't know if this is the case. I thought I heard somewhere that like final draft that it's not as easy to do that. So that's something you want to consider. You, whatever format you're doing, if you're working with a digital letter, you want to be able to make it easier for them so they can just cut and paste the dialogue and they're not going to have to retype everything. So think about that. Talk with your talk with your letter if you have a different letter other than yourself, and uh, you know just think thinking about them and uh, you know be considerate. So that's pretty much all I have really to say about scripting. I mean, there's much more we can talk about. We can dive deeper, and we will a little bit. But uh, you know, this this should serve as a great starting point for you to get started on how to script your comic. We could go on and on and on uh, and create entire you know series on scripting and everything. And there's a lot of information out there on scripting, and, and you can watch other YouTube videos and other other comic book writers and everything to give you a little more you know advice on this. But I think this is going to cover the basics. And if there's something that I didn't cover in this, let me know in the comments section and uh, we can talk it over in the comments or if it's something super important maybe I can I can add a little indendum or something like that or I can bring it up in a bonus episode but other than that that's all I got to say right now about scripting and thanks for watching uh, don't forget to like subscribe hit that bell all that good stuff and I will see you guys later that is all Hey, thanks for watching. If you like what you saw and you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. Also, you can follow me at CertWorks on social media. And now you can support the work that I do on Patreon. Do you like making comics? Then go to CertWorks.com and pick up the Comic Maker Starter Kit. It's packed full of fonts, brushes, templates, and more. And best of all, it's totally free.